My name is Titus Fortner. I, uh, this is my third career. I started out uh, as a submarine officer doing nuclear engineering things on a submarine in the United States Navy. Uh, I do not recommend that if you enjoy sunlight, which I do. It is, uh, yeah, it's, it wasn't the most fun experience. Uh, software ended up being my third career. Uh, day two of the, as my, a junior developer, day two, uh, manager got a group of us together and he's like, all right, we need someone to figure out this Selenium thing. I'm looking around and no one else is raising their hand and I'm like, all right, I'll do it, I'll figure it out. And that was seven years ago. Uh, since then, I've worked at five different companies as a software development engineer and test, working with existing frameworks, writing new frameworks, mostly in Ruby, a little bit in Python. I've gotten to work with some of the really, uh, some of the smartest people out there in this industry, I would say, and uh, it's been really great. Uh, I'm currently at Sauce Labs as a senior solution architect, which means I get to go around to other companies and take a look at their frameworks, take a look at their code, and give them feedback on what they're doing well and what they could do to improve the quality of what they are uh, doing. Also, I'm really big in the open source community. I am a core contributor to the Selenium project, uh, primarily doing the Ruby bindings. And I'm also the lead developer on a project called Water. How many people have heard of Water? Yeah, so Water's been around longer than Selenium, but it re-implemented itself uh, to use WebDriver when WebDriver came out, and so now Water is backed by Selenium, um, and it's essentially a test library built on top of Selenium to provide a little bit more, kind of provide an interface that's a little bit more tester friendly than some of the things that Selenium does natively. And some of the stuff I'll talk about today is things, includes things that I've learned from using water and tools in the water ecosystem uh, for making testing uh, easier. Today is also my birthday. <laughs> My gift is being here with you. All right, so this, the, yeah, thanks. Yeah, th so, yeah. So this, uh, make sure I don't run out of electrons. So this is actually uh, part of a much larger talk. I could do an all day thing with this. I have code. Uh, for all of the stuff that I'm going to be talking about in, I do releases with each workshop that I teach that I put all of the code and all of the slides and so there's like six different versions up there right now. Um, we're not going to walk, we don't have enough time to like actually go through all of the, we're, we probably won't even have time to set everything up if we tried to get everyone working on their laptop today. So I'm just going to be walking through the code and talking about what I'm doing in each step of the code to try and get an idea of what things uh, to be looking at here. And primarily, we're gonna be going over these eight things. And these are the things that essentially are components of putting a framework together and being able to write maintainable tests. So we're gonna start off with a framework overview. What is a framework? Everyone, this is a very overloaded term. Everyone uses this term very differently. Uh, so I like to define what I'm talking about. A lot of people will talk about the test runners, the J unit, the R spec, the N unit, Karma, PyTest, these as, as frameworks. And so oftentimes, what framework are you using? This is what people are asking for, or what, especially at Sauce Labs, what they're asking for. But I consider these test environments, or test runners. These, this one small component of what it takes to put together your tests, to execute your, your Selenium tests or your Appium tests. A lot of these projects will call themselves frameworks. Your WebDriver.io, Capybara, Water, Selenite. These uh, are the test libraries that provide the glue code, essentially, your, your wrappers and your helpers to make it easier for you to do your testing. But I don't consider these frameworks. I kind of give an all-inclusive definition of a framework, which is essentially all of the software that you need to test your website functionally is part of your framework. And the reason I like to give a very inclusive definition there is because everyone has a different framework. They're all unique to a certain extent because everyone implements them differently or creates their own glue code on top of what's out there. Uh, 
Even if you're using RSpec and water, you're also probably using a page object gem. And maybe it's Cheesies, or maybe you've built your own. Or maybe you have some, a data management gem. Maybe you have something specific to how you configure your data. And it's important to look at it this way because you're making a lot of choices throughout putting this code together. And the idea is what, what choices can be improved on, what things can you maybe find a, a better way to do something. So I guarantee everyone's framework is really strong in some areas, hopefully, and uh, also likely poor in others, or just haven't thought through some of the, uh, the ideas there. All right, so I'd like to start out. Record and playback, Selenium ID, I know there was uh, some love for this in uh, Simon's uh, overview. He and I have a fundamental disagreement on this. Um, if you're looking to build a maintainable test suite, which is what this talk is about, do not use the Selenium IDE. Do not use a record and playback device. If anyone has seen a large scale maintainable test suite that was written in Selenium IDE, please let me know. Because <laughs> I've got drinks for those people or something to buy. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm a little concerned about the Selenium ID initiative, and I've, I've been vocal on Twitter and things about it. Uh, I can see some positive things coming from it, some kind of code generation or make it easier to find selectors and things, uh, find, locate elements and things like that. But as a solution for let's put something together with this, I, I feel that people, and you know, a lot of people are like, oh, it's like training wheels. I'm like, well, that's great until you weld those on to your little bicycle. And once you start doing that, it makes it a lot harder to get to the point where you can actually excel and run a race that you need to be uh, succeeding. All right, so the whole purpose of a framework is to reduce maintenance costs. Pretty much anyone that has ever maintained a test suite knows that the maintenance costs are more expensive than the combination of creation costs and execution costs. So every time someone complains, I mean, this is something like at Sauce Labs, right? Oh, Sauce Labs, it's slower than if I run it locally. Yes. If that's what you're concerned about, maximizing, optimizing that execution time, you're looking at it entirely wrong. Your costs are coming in the maintenance time. So let us help you optimize the amount of time that you're spending on maintenance so that you have more time to create and focus on more of the business needs rather than constantly updating. Uh, your code to make sure the tests aren't flaky, digging into poorly written uh, exceptions to figure out where the actual legitimate problem is, and just spending a lot of extra time writing unnecessary tests. Oops. All right, it's dry. What does dry stand for? What is it? Thank you. Thanks. Uh, yeah, so don't repeat yourself. Uh, this is essentially when you're putting a framework together, uh, everything should have a place and it should be obvious where that place is. And uh, so, so some of the patterns I'm gonna be talking about here, I really appreciate because it makes it very obvious to see what, what things need to go where in order to be easier. Like, ah, that got updated, I know exactly where to make that one change for everything to work now. So the components of a test framework. I've got seven of them listed here. We'll walk through each of these. All right, so as an open source proponent, I always bring the slide up here as far as there are a lot of options for test libraries that you can use in all different languages. Ruby has more than others for various reasons. Uh, Java, everyone kind of likes to do their own thing because Java. But there are a lot of different options for things so that you don't have to continue to reinvent the wheel. And if you're looking at an option that's out there and like, ah, oh, this is close to what we want, but not exactly, uh, I would encourage you to not like, oh, this only does 80%, so let's rewrite our own that's, that does exactly what we need. Uh, use the 80% and add on the additional 20% you need. And if you solve a problem that other people might have, feed that back to the open source project and uh, so that the next company that comes along and has a similar issue uh, can have that solution solved for them already. All right, so actions on assertions. 
So we start out listing the popular test runners in each of the different languages. When I talk about test runners, this is like the fundamental, this is what's providing the structure. This is what's keeping you from just running everything as a, from, from your main uh, method or in a, just a Ruby file that's executing that, that either returns a zero or a one at the end. This is what allows you to, to structure your tests with before and after hooks and all of the assertions that you need. All right, so TDD versus BDD. How many people here would say they practice BDD? Actually, how many people here use a BDD tool? How many people that use a BDD tool think that they're doing behavior-driven development? There's one person confidently raising his hand over there. All right, so the idea behind test-driven development is that you uh, write the test and then write the code uh, and get it to pass. Uh, except that test-driven development is essentially just looking at it from a user point of view. And behavior-driven development is supposed to be the working together to do acceptance tests in a specific way. So it's supposed to be more collaborative. All right. So the way I look at test-driven development when it comes to writing tests, so write the test, make sure it's failing, make the code work, make sure it's passing, make the code better. So tell a story of a coworker I had a, at a company a few companies ago. He did not write the best code. I, uh, I was being, you know, as you get better at writing any programming, you get very particular about how things should look and getting really good about writing good code. And I was like, all right, I'm gonna abstract this out, I'm gonna create this other thing. So my boss tells me and my coworker to each automate some, some things and this guy knocked it out the first day. He got his stuff done it, and I looked at it and I'm just like, wow, that's kind of ugly, man. Look, you know, I, two days later, three days later, my boss is like, how are you doing on that title? So I'm like, almost done, almost done with my stuff. I'm, I've got it, it's all pretty, it's gonna be great. And uh, yeah, which of us did my boss like more? Was it me? Because he'd already done three times as much as I had. And this is where kind of the idea of YAGNI, who knows what YAGNI stands for? You ain't gonna need it. Don't over-optimize if you don't know what you need to optimize for. Don't think you know what you're, like recognize that you might actually not know what the pain point is gonna be. You might think, oh, I'm gonna use this pattern a bunch of places and just uh, abstract that at the beginning. I, I can't tell you how many times I've seen page objects where people go through and identify every single element on a page and put it in their page object. Why go to that trouble? You're just polluting your class with stuff that you may never use. So don't, like, write something ugly that works, get it working, and as long as you are not working for someone that's like, ah, you've wrote it, you can't go back and touch it ever, because there are managers like that. As long as you're not working for that manager, just get it working and then worry about optimizing it once you see what the actual pain points are. All right, this is a video, let me see if it. Take it one step at a time, identify the problem, I know Saturday Night Live is not a big thing here in India, but uh, that's my favorite SNL clip. And uh, I think it really accurately uh, summarizes kind of how I think of Agile just in general, of this idea of what's the problem, fix it, it doesn't have to be pretty. If the next biggest problem is making it pretty, then make it pretty, but if the next biggest problem is something else, work on that and, and just try to keep improving what you're doing until you have something that uh, is optimal. All right, so BDD. I like to kind of just throw up an example here for people who aren't familiar. Essentially, you're trying to write English sentences that get parsed through some kind of regular expression and then that translates into some kind of code that gets executed. How many people like working with regular expressions? Oh, okay. If you say so. Um, no, uh, regular expressions are awesome for figuring out like how to parse things that, that you can't, uh, that, that are difficult and get exactly what you need from them, but they're very tricky to maintain. They're very tricky to get a lot of regular expressions that do 
what you need them to do every single time that you need them to do it. It's very easy when you're putting, I've worked at, I think three of the places I've worked have done Cucumber, and uh, in two of them we had a lot of problems where the wrong regular expression was matching what I had just written to the wrong thing. And it's really easy to forget, like, oh wait, where did we put that one? How is this one different from that one? It's in a different library and a completely different file. It takes a lot of forethought and consistency to minimize those uh, interactions. So I always like to put out the warning for BDD in general. BDD is designed to be a collaborative tool. If you're not using it as a collaborative tool, you're creating extra overhead of dealing with a bunch of regular expressions and trying to keep up with where you put all of the code that you're writing. I like to say that Cucumber is for consultants because I think that's the right model to adopt Cucumber is if you've got some vice president that's like, ah, we're not agile, we need to be agile. Let's hire someone to make us agile. And that person comes in and says, okay, let's get all of the stakeholders in the room. This is the process we're gonna follow. We're gonna write these given when then statements that is gonna encompass all of the new features that we're writing and it's not for existing features on the, the existing site, because that's another thing. A lot of people will do BDD tools to write tests for features that already exist. And the whole point of BDD is that you're developing the features by agreeing on what the tests are and going from there. Um, and the other reason that, that some people will say, like, oh no, Cucumber is great because uh, like that, that makes it really easy for one person to write the, the feature files, because that's all they know is English. And so we're, they're just gonna write the English and they'll have someone else that deals with the regular expressions because that's a pain and we don't want to do it. And then we'll have someone else that implements the page objects and the fun stuff. And I'm, that always frustrates me because once you start trying to specialize within groups, you're essentially saying you're never going to be good enough to do this and we don't trust you to do that. And I don't think that's a good way to build a team. You can have some people that are better at some things than others, but everyone should be able to do everything on a team. Like this, this idea of cross-functional agile teams that Yes, someone might be better at back end and someone better at front end, but you're on the same team and if that guy is out of town or she's on vacation, you uh, can take over what they're doing for them. Okay, here's some code. It works. Is it a test? Why is it not a test? It's no assertions. I, uh, I inherited, a, inherited a, a, a suite of tests once that uh, didn't have any assertions. And I was just like, okay. So I dutifully went through and was adding assertions. Um, the, the funny part is that I, I found a bug and I submitted it to, uh, put it in the, the bug tracker and sent it off. And the next morning I came in to get an email back from product that had updated it with uh, uh, priority five won't fix. All right, so why am I maintaining a test that no one cares about? Why am I putting all this time and energy and why are we running things? And if this, is, is, this can't be the only test that we're running that you don't actually care about. So this idea of make sure that the tests that you're running are, the are actionable. Things that if they pass, they give you some additional confidence that the system is working. And if they fail, you're gonna do something about it other than just say, oh yeah, that's nice. Like the three components here then of any given test is going to be an assert, arrange, arrange, act, assert. This is essentially the given when then of a Gherkin or, or BDD. Uh, there's a school of thought out there that says you should only ever have one assertion per test and I don't subscribe to that school of thought. Um, I think the important part is the action that you're taking. That's the name of the test, the one thing that you're doing, and so the point of the arrange is to do the minimum possible to create an exactly known state in order for you to take the focused action that you care about, and then whatever things result from that action being successful, go in the assertion. So if you need to see a success message and you need to see the item added to the list, go ahead and put both of those assertions in there as far as I'm concerned, because if either of, the one, either of them aren't working, it's the action is not, is not doing the right thing. And 
this also kind of gets into assertions versus exceptions. An assertion is the intent of the test. Is the intent met or not? Uh, most test runners will make a distinction between whether or not an assertion failed or whether there was an exception. Uh, I see a lot of people putting assertions everywhere in their code. Uh, navigate to this page, assert on that page. Click this link, assert link clicked. Navigate to this page, <laughs> assert. Um, and, and there's some value to that in order to get certain types of information, but I like to make a clear distinction between have I tested what I intended to test and did it work? Did it not work or could I not even get to the point where I could test that in the first place? And so if you feel the need to stop where you're at if some condition's not met, I would recommend raising an, except, raising an exception instead of just making an assertion in your page objects or wherever you've abstracted things. All right, and the last thing about uh, tests here is their attributes. Tests should be atomic, autonomous, and short. The goal here is to have very focused tests, and this is, again, the action part. What is it that, what action are you testing? What functionality? What chunk of usefulness in your web application? It should be autonomous. So they can be run in any order or at the same time. No state should be transitioning between them. Uh, we'll talk about, the data is really where this gets a little tricky. We'll talk about that here in a little bit. Um, and the other thing is for it to just be short. The longer your, your tests run, the more likely some weird problem is gonna come up that uh, is gonna cause it to fail when it shouldn't. And uh, having a bunch of shorter tests is definitely preferable to fewer, longer running tests when it comes to scaling. All right, so next part of a framework is the initializing and the cleanup. So usually this goes in some kind of a base test class of some kind where you do your, your setup and your teardown. Start the driver, quit the driver, whatever other things need to go in here. Sometimes you'll put some kind of reporting thing in here if you're doing JUnit. How many people are JUnit here, just out of curiosity? How many people are test ng? Interesting. Okay. This is what I do in JUnit uh, with, uh, essentially I've got a, a, the use sauce there for if it's running locally, if it's running on uh, sauce labs. But uh, what, what are you doing if it's passing or failing? How are you reporting that? What this can, and this can be into your, your Jenkins could get this information. You could be passing it from an API into uh, any kind of like test rail or rally or anything I've actually written. APIs that will pass that kind of information back into all, all kinds of these third party uh, tracking systems. This is where you set your options. Um, this is an easy one to show because it's very obvious when the browser opens if the info bar is there or not and it's just adding an argument for that. Uh, Chrome literally has hundreds of different things that you can toggle uh, to do all kinds of things that you probably would never need to do, but it's an interesting list. The other thing I like to point out, if you're running things locally, um, one of the most common things on the, SOS, on the uh, Selenium forums, whenever someone comes in, like my tests were working yesterday and now they're broken, first question, Update your, or first thing, update your driver. Like, always, because especially in Chrome, it's almost always, oh yeah, Chrome's got like a rolling three version or four versions that their driver supports. The browser automatically updates, the driver does not. Uh, so I like pointing out this, uh, this library here, the Web Driver Manager. Uh, I wrote something in Ruby that will automatically download and provide for the user the latest driver if they don't already have it on their system. I'm like, ah, it would be nice if we had this in all the languages. And someone's like, Java already has it, here it is. I'm like, yes, let's publicize this. Because if you are not using a third party service to execute your tests or some kind of Docker container or something that keeps everything together or don't limit your browser to not auto update, having something that will also auto update your driver is huge. And the other thing, just to kind of walk through a quick uh, Sauce Labs, how it works. This is my account. I have not given you my access key. 
but this is where it would be. And you just take that username and your access key and you pass that in as part of your sauce URL. So if you are already running on a grid somewhere, moving to a third party provider like Sauce Labs is mostly just changing the URL and then updating the specific information. So we've got a little platform configurator here where you just use the UI to pick which things you want and then we'll give you the code in the different language down here that you copy and paste into your code to get that particular combination of browser and operating system. Also pointing out that uh, W3C is gonna be changing. Like the biggest thing that the W3C is probably gonna be changing is the desired capabilities. The desired capabilities is going away. Uh, Java and C Sharp are both using an options class and it says desired capabilities deprecated, please use the options class. And the options class is implementing the desired capabilities underneath. Uh, I still have some stuff to do for Ruby to make that happier. It's on my list. But uh, what it means for third parties like Sauce Labs is that there is a defined list of things that are allowed to be sent in as a capability. And so right now, Sauce Labs, you just send that as part of the root level desired capabilities and it works. With W3C, it won't. So we have to have a little Sauce option. So like any third party, whether it's Google or Mozilla, so Google, if they have special things, it'd be Goog colon. Mozilla, it's Moz colon, and like, and like that. So anything that doesn't fit what's specified in the W3C, does everyone know that we got the W, yeah, Simon talked about it, W3C uh, a couple weeks ago. So we have our special key for that. Just something to keep in mind that when 4.0 comes out, this will probably be required for a lot of clients to, to be doing something like this if you want to use Selenium 4 uh, with a provider like Sauce Labs. And I don't want to take too much time talking about Sauce Labs, but just wanted to show that when you execute your tests on Sauce Labs, you get a screen that looks like this. You can run a bunch of tests at the same time that will give you your browser operating system combination whether it passed or failed or threw an error. And then each specific test is going to give you ability to watch the video of it. You can see exactly which wire calls the test made and what the input and output of each call was and then screenshots if the DOM is likely to have changed with the action you took. We also have logs and metadata options. So those are all things they configured in uh, the initialization. The next big thing is data. So this is probably one of the biggest things when it comes to scaling up your tests. Like what, what needs to be fixed or addressed or improved in order to make your tests scale better. So there's three approaches to data. First one I call grab and hope. This is the one where you just take whatever's on the page and you hope it's in the state that it needs to be in in order for your test to work. A uh, good example of this is an e-commerce site where you go to the page and you grab the first product on the page and you go to check out with it, which works great until the staging environment says, ah, it's out of stock. And so now you're gonna get a failure for that product even though the system is working perfectly because you grabbed one thing and hoped that it was in the condition that it, it needed to be in and it was not. The next option is fixtures. So think of fixtures, this is like the, the spreadsheet model where you have a spreadsheet of these are the 10 users and each of these 10 users have these different properties and each test designates which of the hard codes in some fashion, which user it needs to use. This is difficult because whenever you have an additional property, you end up often doubling the number of things that you have. Like, oh, well we need half of them with this turned on and half of them with this turned off and so now we're gonna double the number of users we have so that we have the right conditions and still all of the combinations of permutations that we need, uh, it gets really difficult to maintain. But this is the way a lot of companies, the way their systems are set up, uh, it makes it difficult not to do something along those lines. The ideal is to use what I call a just-in-time system. And this is every single test is responsible for creating all of the data that it needs for that test. And yes, that takes a little bit of extra time in the beginning relative to creating everything ahead of time and using that. But again, we're trying to optimize maintenance time, not optimize 
the execution time. And if increasing the execution time a little bit decreases the maintenance time significantly, that's a huge win. This is what makes it difficult for people to run at scale. This is where when you're running 50 tests at the same time, one test is gonna fail sometimes, and you don't know why. And after hours and days of working with it, you realize, ah, it's failing because this other test just happens to be running at the same time, and when they're both running at the same time, there's a problem, but if they're not running at the same time, there's not. Very hard to track down, but it makes your test suite very unreliable, and it's really hard to figure out why. And so if you can do everything that you can with a just-in-time approach, that's going to be uh, the most useful. All right, so we've got an email of user at example.com and a password of password. What does this tell us about the test that we're running? It, yeah, it could, it could have something to do with password not being complex enough. It, it could have something to do with example.com not being a real address and so there's some failure. Uh, it could be that this user doesn't exist. It could be this user does exist. We really don't have any information that's useful that tells us why we're using this particular data. So I use what I call static data. I will create a valid user from a user object. So this is just a plain old Java object here that's gonna have some properties. And these properties, in this case, are just email and password. This will get a lot more complicated if you're doing an address book or uh, credit card data or any, any other data that you're working with. There can be a lot of fields here. But the goal here is just to identify what it is that you want, and it's hard-coded in one place here, and it's gonna return an instance of that object with those values. Which is great until you need to sign up, for instance. This will work for a sign in, because that's a valid user, but what about sign up? I need some kind of random user in my test for a sign up. So do something like this, Faker. Who here is familiar with Faker? All right, yeah, so I gave a talk earlier this year at uh, the Automation Guild, it's the virtual conference that uh, Joe Colantonio does, and I briefly referenced Faker, and everyone, the first three questions I got at the end of the, uh, the talk had to do with talk about random data, like how are you doing this, what is that class, how does that work? Um, Essentially, I want a random email address and a random password, and faker.internet will give me those things. You have a bunch of different options with Faker. Internet, you're, you want an IP address, you want a port, you want a random URL, a name, first name, last name, suffix, title, address. You want something in Italy, it'll give you an Italy zip code that's uh, randomized. Lorem is the, the text, finance for your credit cards, date and time for Again, all kinds of different localizations, and Chuck Norris facts. Who here does not know Chuck Norris facts? Everyone knows Chuck Norris facts? Oh, there's a few people, all right. Okay, we're gonna. This is important. I didn't realize that people in the United States didn't know about Chuck Norris facts. So this is Ruby, but it's easier to use for me. Did everyone see this? All right, no statement can catch the Chuck Norris exception. Um, Chuck Norris does not use exceptions when programming, has not been able to identify any of his code that is not exceptional. Uh, Chuck Norris rewrote the Google search engine from scratch. Uh, my, my favorite is, uh, is Chuck Norris can recite pi backwards. Um, so yeah, so if you just need a random fact, that's a very important library. But there's, there's literally dozens or hundreds of libraries that, that do all kinds of uh, random things. And I see a lot of people, again, especially in the Java community, that will write their own randomization things from scratch when there's a perfectly good library that has all of that already available. All right, so we had a random user. But random user doesn't necessarily make sense either because most, we don't really care what username or the password is, what the email is, like th that data doesn't matter. And so it makes sense for us to set a default for these things. And so 
We shouldn't need random user because anytime we initialize a user object, it should default to giving us random data. And so random user becomes redundant. Give me a user, give me a set of user data, might be a better way to say that, and use that, which is great until we need to do something like a blank password. So this is an implementation that shows how to override the default data with the data that is contextually important. In this case, it's password is an empty string. It might be uh, we need to ship a product to Alaska and if it's going to Alaska, it can't have alcohol content because uh, we can't fly alcohol content and so that can only go to the continental United States. That was a real test that I wrote a few years ago. And uh, so you have to specify that I want an Alaska address, and, but you don't care what the first name or the last name or the street address is. You just care that it's going to Alaska with the right zip code. So the next thing to talk about is configuration data. Um, these are like interrelated chunks of data. So this is an example of something you would send to Sauce Labs, for instance, of I want Windows 10 platform, I want a browser Chrome, I want version 65. For the purpose of our test, this doesn't, it doesn't make any difference if platform by itself doesn't make sense. Browser name by itself doesn't make sense. These are things that have to be together in a chunk in order for them to make sense. And so I do not like to include this kind of data in my test logic. Most people put this data hard-coded in their before step. I'll see all sorts of configuration data, usually with really complicated conditionals for a lot of different things, just a lot of data interspersed in the logic. I much prefer to have some kind of key that says, if I want Windows 8 IE, give me this chunk of things. And then my conditional becomes pulling something from an environment variable or a system property to give me the, the collection of data that I want rather than having to specify it in a long conditional inside my code. Uh, this is an example of a YAML format. I really like YAML just because it's both easy to, it's serialized and easy to read. Uh, JSON I do not find as easy to read. You could do the same thing with like a Java properties file or something. But the idea is to chunk like things together and pull them outside of your test code. The other thing that I see a lot of is people putting a lot of variables and properties in their CI tools. As someone who has spent way more hours than I would care to admit to updating Jenkins configurations, I highly recommend that everything that is some kind of variable, that is some kind of toggle, be put in your code. Version controls, uh, either, like I wouldn't even use like string properties in Jenkins where you list environment variables. I don't even do that anymore. Uh, I've also seen in the build steps having all of these flags and parameters after each one. Create some kind of make file or rake file that lists out whatever that execution is and call it directly. So your build step is essentially just a one line thing saying this is the collection of stuff that this build is executing. It's a lot easier to maintain and it's easier to see when you change something than oh we changed something, something's different, we're not sure what. Uh, it makes it a lot easier to maintain and see when there might be a problem, what might have changed. All right, so the next thing is, is site modeling. So this is your, your page object model. One of the things I really enjoy talking about is this idea of uh, declarative versus imperative. It's very common, when, it's one of the things I do when I'm looking at someone's, uh, when I'm looking at a, a, a company's framework, if I'm doing a framework assessment for Sauce Labs, I'm taking a look. This is one of the big things that I, I work with clients about and that I've gotten a lot of good feedback on. This idea that the text of your test should be high level. It should not be including your implementation logic. So declarative is a big picture, the what, the business logic, Big picture, contextually relevant data. Imperative is the how, the implementation details, specifics, 
specifies all of the data. So this would be an example of something imperative. We're referencing a driver. We're making a specific call to navigate. We're finding something and clicking it. We're waiting for something. We are specifying non-contextually useful data. We're, again, identifying an element and sending keys. We're clicking. That whole thing. Compare that to something like this. We're signing in. We're, we're visiting. We're signing in. We're verifying. Our given when then. The only tricky thing here is we're initializing a new home page instance. Everything else is very straightforward. Sign in page visit, sign in page sign in with data, a valid user, and assert that on the home page we're signed in. I, uh, I always write my tests first like this. Um, one of the things I like to point out here is when I'm writing this test this way, the method that I'm choosing is sign in. I'm on the sign in page, I'm signing in with a valid user. If I was implementing the page object first, I probably would have implemented a fill form method. And that's just one example of something. This is more contextually useful when you're reading the test. Sign in page, sign in data, rather than something that's a little bit more descriptive of fill form. Um, one of the ways that I think about well, another thing uh, that I think about with this is, does this apply to both mobile and web? Your desktop browser versus your mobile browser versus the native application? Sign in is a function that works for all three. You want it to be true in all three of those instances. If you are specifying select drop down, click this, click this other thing, click this link, those things are less likely to apply in a mobile device? Like, and what if it changes from a drop down to a checkbox? Does that fundamentally change the behavior of the system? It's an implementation detail. And so it should not, you shouldn't need to go into the text of your test in order to update those things. That should be done in your page object implementation. And then as far as the naming, uh, like I said, I like, I like thinking about what the names are from the test perspective, from the user perspective, rather than the implementation perspective. And, and this comes down to the idea of the, the two hard problems of computer science, cache and validation, naming things, and off by one errors. All right, so yeah, so I always start with writing the test, then I write the methods for those tests, and then figure out exactly what elements I need, and then only write the locator for those elements uh, like I mentioned earlier, instead of writing every single element on the page, you're like, oh, I'm already here, I might as well do all of these. It clutters up your test. When you make changes, you don't know what all changes need to be made. Like, what happens if you have one that you're using and 10 that you're not, and you have to update the one that you're using? Do you then have to update everything else? You don't know. You would have to go through, and it's not necessarily something that you need. All right, well, I have a whole talk on these. How many people use a page factory here? The people who write, wrote the page factory wish that they had not written the page factory. Uh, page, page factory obfuscates some things and makes some things difficult in a way that's difficult to scale, but because it's in the project, people think it's the only way to do it. I just want to put out there that it's not the only way to do it. If you're using it, I'm not saying change it. But if you're, if you're not using it and thinking this is the way I have to do it, it's not. And we're, we still argue back and forth as to whether or not it's going to stay in the project or if it's going to be rolled out into a separate library. I, I'm honestly not sure where we're at on that this week because it seems to change regularly, but there is a desire. Um, I already talked about overpopulating the base page. Oh, sorry, I didn't talk about the base page. Overpopulating page objects in general is a problem. Overpopulating the base page, I'll talk about that one a little bit more in a minute. Coupling. The original page object design pattern specified that every method in a page object should return an instance of another page object. In my experience, that causes more problems than it solves. 
you go to the home page, you click sign in, you get a login form, you fill out the login form, you hit enter, it takes you back to a landing page. That's great. What happens if you're at the cart and you're about to sign out of the cart and it'll ask, do you want to log in? Oh, like, oh yes, I'll log in. So it takes you to the login page, you log in. Does it take you back to the landing page? No, it takes you to back to the cart. Do you need two page objects? Do you need two methods? Do you need, how do you handle that if you're coupling your page objects together in that way? So I do not find it overly challenging to just initialize a new page object at the places that I need a new page object, and I much prefer that than trying to have that navigational logic embedded everywhere in my pages. Multiple expectations for methods. This is an interesting one for the whole like, fill form successfully, fill form unsuccessfully. This idea that both of them fill a form, but one of them is gonna have a different outcome than the other based on what you intend. And as we're moving to be more declarative in the tests that we're writing, it doesn't necessarily make sense to call the same method if we're expecting one to have one result, expecting it to have one result one time and another result the other time. It could be a lot easier, depending on the context, to have separate ones that can have their own specific weighting uh, methods or parameters as necessary. Conditionals based on state. This is one of the ones that really frustrates me. I've seen people stand up on stages like this one that people about this size sit in talking about how, yes, the way you have a page object for mobile and browser is to look for the mobile element and if you don't see it, go down the browser path and if you do see it, go down the mobile path. That really frustrates me because we are in an era of dynamic sites. So what happens if when you say, is the mobile element there, it just wasn't there in time and it was gonna show up 0.1 seconds later. It's a bad pattern to get into. You're, you're, your test already knows. Your test knows if it's testing a mobile application or a browser. It's either in a configuration file that figured out what it was gonna start up in the first place, or you can ask the driver, are you an Appium driver, are you a Selenium driver? You should never have to query the state of the browser or, the, uh, or an element in order to, to figure out what conditional. Uh, one, of the, one of the companies I worked at had a really, really over-engineered uh, framework. It was really impressive, actually. It would try and automagically figure out all sorts of things on the fly. And so there would be these, these forms that would get filled out that were like 10 pages long. And it would be like, all right, so populate the, if you see this data, then populate it. And if you don't see this data, then, then do this other thing. And if you see a next button, then click the next button, then populate what you can see. And then if there's a publish button, hit that. And if there's not, then hit finish. And that would work great if the site stayed in a 2005 static presentation. But once anything started getting dynamic and once there was any latency lag, Firefox and Chrome would, would behave slightly differently with these things. All of a sudden it's like, hey, click this if you see it and if not, click this other thing. That becomes a very bad pattern because again, it, it wasn't there and so it went down the wrong path and we would get a failure when the system was working just fine. Specifying navigation, this is, I usually do a visit method on my, uh, on my page objects. So part of, part of what I try to do when I'm doing my UI tests is to try and have as minimal setup as possible to get the exact state that I need. So I, I don't necessarily care that I start on the home page and I click on the sign in button to get to the sign in page and then click the sign up button to get the sign up page and then fill out a form. I just wanna be on the sign up page. So I have a visit method and I put the URL that I need to get to directly in there. If it's a browser, if it's mobile, you have to do something a little bit more. But I always have a visit method to say whatever is the easiest way for me to set the state of being on this page, make that happen. Um, and so that is kind of coupling because I will use other page objects sometimes. In reference, on the home page, click this button. On the sign in page, click this button. And now I'm on the sign up page. Uh, but I find that a lot more useful than coupling uh, from, the, uh, from the, the return statements of methods. Unhelpful error messages. This is another one that takes a long time to debug problems. You have, uh, like what normally happens
happens, right? With the biggest error here, element not found. Okay, element not found. Why is it not found? I have no idea. You, you look at the stack trace. Well, the stack trace is usually, you know, two lines further down from the last action that you took. And so, and especially if it's any size test, you know, like, ah, five minutes in, we get an element exception, uh, element not found exception. Let's, all right, we need to put a debug point here and then walk back through or take a look at the video that you have or any, any of, uh, any of the, the screenshots that you might have taken to see what's going on. Uh, finding ways to put in useful error messages or finding ways to make assertion, um, raise exceptions in places that have more contextual meaning. So for instance, this is kind of where the successful sign-in versus unsuccessful sign-in idea comes up. If at the end of the method for successful sign-in or unsuccessful sign-in, you are waiting for a condition or you are expecting a specific condition, you can throw a more useful error message that will let you know, aha, the issue isn't I couldn't click on the you know, uh, checkout button, the issue is that I couldn't submit the previous form because this field was missing something. So finding ways to increase the, the value of your test by getting useful error messages where you need it is very useful. Uh, I also try to avoid checking the absence of an element. It's a lot easier to explicitly say, is this element here, than it is to say, is this element not here, especially in a dynamic environment. So if you have a, a choice of is the sign, like are we signed in, maybe check to see that the username is there and are we signed out, check that the sign in link is there when it wouldn't be otherwise rather than, rather than saying, rather than just having a Boolean that is if you see it then it's true and if you don't see it it's false. Uh, try to actively check for things to be true. All right, wrappers and helpers, this is the fun part. Are we on break out there? Is, is this the, yeah. So this is like two sessions in a row here. So we're, we're doing a little, a little more here. Okay, so, wrappers and helpers. So this is the glue code. This is the stuff that like water is really good at in Ruby. These are the things that, that uh, help take problems that, that would have in your code and make it easier to deal with from a testing standpoint. Um, so the biggest things that would cause flakiness in your test. So this is your system is working, but there is a problem, but your tests are failing. These are the errors you're most likely getting. It's stale, not visible, can't click it. Almost all of these are addressed with some form of synchronization. And there's five different ways to do synchronization. Three of them are local and two of them are global. So let's talk about the local ones. Hard coding sleeps. This is literally the first thing I do when I see someone's code for the first time. I do a search for sleeps and see just where they're at with it. Like how, how good is what they have done to figure out how to make it work without a lot of band-aids, how mature is the framework. Uh, there are a couple places where I might use a sleep, but not for synchronizing a site specifically. So fluent wait, this is a specific Java implementation. Uh, the idea of like returning self from each method so that you can update parameters. Uh, usually I find this to be overkill and so most of the time when I'm writing uh, Java code, I'll just use an explicit wait because it's just this easy one line. So the issue, one of the other disagreements I have gotten into with some of the other core contributors in the Selenium project has to do with the idea of global weights. Traditionally, this is an implicit weight. An implicit weight, who here uses implicit weights? Who here used to use them and or knows, please don't ever use implicit weights? Okay, who doesn't know what an implicit weight is? Okay, there's most of you are not raising your hand at all. All right, so implicit weight is, a, so an explicit weight is the code polling for the condition. Hey, element, are you there? No, are you there? No, are you there? Yes, okay, now continue. Uh, an implicit wait is a global setting 
to the driver that says, go locate this and don't come back until you found it and time out at this point. And so the code no longer has any control. There's no, more, there's no test logic that happens. If you ever do a find element or a find elements and it's not there, it's gonna wait that timeout length before it comes back and returns control to the code. I like the idea of implicit weights. I do not like the way that it's implemented in Selenium. There could be problems with, if you do want to check to see whether or not an element is not there, it's, you have to wait for the full timeout in order to validate that. Uh, and the other issue is, Mixing implicit weights and explicit weights can have some really weird behaviors. You can get these weird exponential things that are really hard to debug, and it's, it's not fun. But there's another option other than using an, an implicit weight to get the same be global benefits that an implicit weight provides. So most, how many people have base pages for their page object? Make heavy use of those? All right. I think base pages get overused a lot, and we'll talk about that in a second. But one of the things that you can do in a base page is to provide a global weighting strategy, or as I like to call it, an abstracted weight. And that's essentially for every action, so this isn't on location, this is on an action. If you're gonna click something, you should never say to click an element that you think might not be there. Your test should be declarative, it should be click this element, it's going to be there, and if it's not, then it's an exception. So go ahead and wait for that before you do the click. Make sure that it's in, it's present, it's displayed, it's enabled, whatever, whatever that logic needs to be for you to want to do that, make sure it's in that state before you, you take that action. And you do that on your click, your send keys, your clear, your uh, select, any, any action that you're taking on an element. And what this does is it provides you global protection for the element not being in a state. Uh, one of the things in a previous version of, we don't really get too into water history, but essentially when water was ad adopted WebDriver as its implementation, it adopted a very Selenium view of uh, take an action and if it doesn't work, throw an exception. And what people would end up doing is we had this method called when present. And so define element dot when present dot click. And just looking at it, it's like, well, this doesn't make any sense. When would I ever want to click something that's not present? So why is when present sometimes there and sometimes not? So the first time anything would ever fail, we'd be like, ah, oh, well, maybe it's a synchronization issue. Dot when present. All right, now run it again. And just wasting a whole bunch of time just seeing maybe that'll fix it, uh, which is not the most efficient way to do things. And you would have when present scattered throughout your code. So what we ended up doing uh, when we updated to Water 6 two years ago is I put together logic that made it so that it was a universally, globally applied system on the action. Every time an action was taken, we would check to make sure that the text field was not read only. We check to make sure that the button is not disabled because you should never, in a test, try to click a disabled button because, again, it, should, it would not do what the test would be testing for. So essentially it would look about like, well, so that's just showing how to extend a base page, yeah. So the problem with that is performance. If every single time you are clicking something, you are sending a wire call, are you there? Yes, are you displayed? Yes, are you enabled? Yes, okay, now do it. Um, we had someone from, uh, it was at SauceCon last year, and uh, someone came up to me and was like, ah, oh, I'm using water, I, I love it, it's great, it's super reliable, but it's just really slow. I'm like, ah, it's not that much slower. Running it locally, yeah, it's like 15% overhead. Well, you run it on an external service like Sauce Labs, and I'm like, oh yeah, this is a lot slower. So we went through, and I'm like, well, what is, it's super chatty, it's making all these extra wire calls. Well, what if, instead of making all these wire calls, we move from going wait act to act wait act? From a computer science standpoint, this is not good design because this is flow control by exception, which is bad. But it's very performant. It only does the weights when you need to wait. And if you don't need to wait, it doesn't make any extra wire calls. So this is kind of the ask for forgiveness instead of ask for permission model. And if I'm working with anyone to speed up tests on Sauce Labs, 
usually the issue is some kind of latency. It's just a lot of, there is some set amount of time for each wire call to get sent and received that vastly overwhelms all of the processing time on each side. Anything you could do to decrease wire calls is gonna have a huge improvement. So last summer, I, I, when, uh, when, we when we implemented a wait, act, wait, sorry, an act, wait, act strategy, uh, Slack, who uses water, uh, reported a 30% performance improvement. I said, great, excellent. And then we took another stab at it. Uh, Schwab earlier this year was also complaining about water being a little too slow. And we took another stab at it and got another 20% out of it by reducing some of our extra wire calls for some of the validations that we were doing, things that were redundant. And so there's a lot of things like this that people design their, their tests locally where it doesn't matter how many wire calls are made because they're milliseconds. But if, you're, if you have tests that are executing on a remote system, that's something to keep in mind as far as how many wire calls are you making and what can you do to decrease. So if you have any kind of global waiting strategy or even if you've got explicit weights in a lot of places, finding a way to take that explicit weight and doing the weight and then act and trying it and rescuing it. Um, in water, our, our logic for this is like 40 lines long. So there's a lot of conditionals and there's a lot of things to make sure that we're handling it exactly the way we want. We handle text fields differently than we handle buttons, which we handle differently than divs and anchors. So there is a lot more logic that we put into it, a lot more logic that can go here but that's something to keep in mind. Um, where's my mouse? There we go. Another thing I wanna touch on is the idea of composition versus inheritance. One of the things I don't like about a lot of base pages that I see is it's like, let's take all of the different methods that is common, like anything that we might use on more than one page object and let's put it in the base page. Problem with this is you now have a whole bunch of things that don't apply to most pages or just pollute the, the, that namespace in a way that's not obvious. So anytime we can create objects that can be acted on in a more contextually meaningful way, so rather than just putting click as a method in the base page, what about doing a get element? We create an element object, we compose it with the Selenium object, and now we can query that object for taking actions or getting information or any of the things we're gonna do with it, rather than just putting all of that stuff up into one huge base page implementation. So this is another thing to consider is Minimizing how much extra stuff is in your base page by trying to abstract out into uh, separate wrapper classes. And maybe that means like having a browser class that, that you can ask the URL and the title and things of, and having an, a Windows class where you can interact with Windows and alerts and things like that, independently of just throwing everything that might be used in more than one page object in the base page. So this pretty much comes down to figure out the reason for the test, write your arrange act assert, figure out what data you need, figure out what pages are gonna be used, then I implement the data, implement the actions, implement the elements, and then hopefully everything works. Hopefully. All right, so getting this to work at scale. So this means Parallel, and parallel means autonomous. So, I wrote a Rails app for this address book. It's at a.testaddressbook.com. It's essentially the very basic component of any test automation, authentication, and CRUD. So manual testers, when they go through a site like this, they're gonna try and find the most efficient flow that they can do in order to test all of the things that need to be tested. A journey for them might look something like this for the happy path, going through and doing the navigation, taking the actions, doing the verifications, all the way through. When we look at something like this though, there's really only six things on this list that are especially important. 
We care about sign up, sign out, sign in, new address, edit address, delete address. These are the functions that matter in this flow. And while for a user, doing them all one, or af one after another and doing whatever variations on those pages makes sense, from a computer standpoint, it doesn't make sense to do all of those in your automation together. That's the code for doing all of that. When I ran that on SAS Labs in water, this was before I optimized water, so it was slow. About three minutes to run it all in serial. So what if, instead of running it all one after another, we break it up into the six separate components? Need to sign up. We created, yes. Sign up, log out, log in. Authenticated, yes. Addresses. In order to create an address, we just need to have a new user. New user could create an address and we check and see if the address is created. To edit address, we need to sign up a new user and create an address. There are steps that, for some of these tests, don't need to be taken to do the bare minimum to test the action that we care about. So I split these up, I actually split these up into eight tests last summer. And I got this running in a minute and a half. Essentially, we are limited by how long the, the uh, sorry, this is very difficult to read, but um, the edit at the bottom here is what took all of that time. Everything else completed in less time, and so you're essentially, when you're running in parallel, you're limited to how long did the longest thing take to run. And then the issue is when you split it up, once you've split it up into something like this, then it's like, okay, now what can I do to make that even faster? And that's where APIs come in. We're talking about responsive websites and dynamic things. When we have your Reacts and your Angulars and your services that are taking the same information at the same endpoints from both mobile and web applications, you have some gateway. There's certain endpoints, there's certain JSON blobs it's expecting to see, certain JSON blobs it's gonna send back. When you have this kind of gateway, what that means is the same information that you're sending through the web application, you could send through a REST client or some HTML library. Rather than creating an address by locating every single field on that page, locating it, sending text, locating it, sending text, locating, querying something about which is selected and selecting it or not selecting it down the list. Put all that JSON into one blob, send it to the one endpoint, and you've now set state. You can now edit that address or you can delete that address without having to spend all of the time it takes to put that together. Another interesting thing here is authentication. This doesn't always work, but it is possible for you to send a REST call to get a token for authenticating a user. So I can create a user via REST call, another REST call to authenticate that user, get the token back and just add it as a cookie into the browser. The only trick here is you have to be on the same domain as what the cookie is gonna be set in order to use that cookie. But you just upload that in there and this can save you, if you have to be logged in for most of your tests, this could save you 15, 20 seconds on every single test. You don't have to go to a page, fill out a form, it all happens in the background and you navigate directly to the site you need to be on. Uh, Sometimes this doesn't work in production for cross-site scripting issues. There's certain things, there's certain security things that could come into place. I've actually had success at companies that I've worked at to get special things set for staging environments. So at one place I had a, an admin password that you could automatically create credentials on a staging environment or something that allowed you to get a token that wouldn't work exactly the same way on production. Uh, so that's something to keep in mind that even if there's not something that is enabled in production, you might be able to work with your developers. Uh, same kind of thing, creating a user, like sometimes they have to be provisioned or you have to verify an email address before you can start using that user in production. So that's why people will create all of the, we've got 10 users for all of our tests because it's gonna take us a while to provision all of those users. Well, oftentimes you can work with your developers to automatically provision a user in some fashion, automatically set state for that user in a staging environment. And that might be, hey, the message queue normally checks every 20 minutes for something. Well, in the staging environment, 
let's set it down to 15 seconds, 10 seconds. And that way, it's something that you can automate in a, in a, a much easier fashion. And so I kind of refer to this usage of APIs as uh, transitive testing. Because essentially, if you can verify that what's going on in the UI is the same thing as what's going on in the API, you don't have to use the UI in order to set state. So you are creating a user in the API, logging in, and then you can just make sure that both the browser and the backend through the, API, through the REST client are giving the same result. Now do that in the API. Create the user, authenticate the user. Now you can create an address. Same thing with deleting an address. Create the user, authenticate, create. All you're doing here in this task is making a bunch of API calls with the REST client, opening the browser to the base. Uh, since you have to open the browser to the base URL, set the cookie, navigate directly to the address that was created from the ID that you got back from the REST call, and then delete that, click the delete button, and verify that it's been deleted. And once you can do all of this, you can run the same thing that took us a minute and a half. We've now got this down to 45 seconds, because you're not going through the UI for everything. Um, I'd throw this slide up here. Uh, Mark Renningham uh, has a, an API framework uh, repository that has implementations in each of the different languages. Uh, I, I updated the Ruby ones with um, more syntactically correct Ruby stuff, and then I kind of took what he did and made something, uh, a gem of my own, that kind of took these ideas and expanded them. But this is a good way to kind of take a look at how you could test um, he has, he's got a, an API uh, or a, uh, a web application for booking that, that he uh, has a lot of examples for. So, all right, so that's my presentation for today. Does anyone have any questions for me? I think we've got a few minutes still. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. the, the reporting? Yeah. in your afterhook or whatever. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So he's asking about reporting. Um, I'm not sure I'm, I'm gathering the full, the full uh, context, but you're essentially uh, like in the afterhook. Like, so either you have a, a watcher that's going to pay attention to when hooks get, get sent off and, and execute at the end of the test, or you have an afterhook in your test runner. Right. Are you asking about performance? Uh, not a performance, more of a reporting. Yeah, I think it's more for specific APIs you want to measure how much time it's taking. Reporting, reporting yeah. of the uh, runway runs. Then what do you want to say? I mean, what is the well, well, the reporting I'm talking about is like the functionality. So like it's, it's essentially you've got an assertion, it passes or fails, and then what you do with that, you have complete control for where you're sending it, how you're storing it, how you display it. That you can create your own dashboard that'll do those things. There's all sorts of different options that you have for what you do with the, uh, the result of the assertion that you make. 